Hello, my name is Patrick Morris and I'm a Senior Applications and Development Engineer for Sputtering Components. And today I'm going to go over sputtering with Rotary Cathodes 101. We're going to start off by looking at the origins of the history of the sputtering process, then explore the physics of diode sputtering, and finish up by exploring the physics of magnetically confined sputtering that is used today. When people ask me what I do and I tell them that I work for a company called Sputtering Components, they often give me a confused look, and that's because the entomology of the root word sputtering roughly translates to spout, inject, spray, splash, sprinkle, or squirt. And it's originally used to describe the act of speaking hastily and having moist matter thrown out in small detached particles, as you can see in the picture to the right. The first use of sputtering for the process that we use today was first recorded in the Journal of Philosophical Transactions in 1852 by William Robert Grove, as he described connecting silver plates within a vacuum vessel to a battery in a transformer. And when he did this, he observed a glow discharge on the silver plate that left it shiny. And this actually turned out to be diode sputtering. In the drawing on this slide, you can see on the left, a battery, and then two wires going to a crude transformer. And then from there, the wires are going to a vacuum chamber, which is basically a bell jar with a spike going through the top, and then down to a silver plate down in the bottom. And as he applied power in a pulsing fashion, he was actually able to create a glow discharge that started to sputter the plate that was down at the bottom. Shortly after Grove's findings in the late 1800s, people started using diode sputtering to produce optical films on lenses and mirrors. Thomas Edison even used diode sputtering to coat his wax cylinder phonographs before electroplating them. In the 1930s, Franz Michael Penning trapped charged particles using magnetic fields, which became the basic foundations for modern magnetron sputtering. In the diode sputtering process, discovered by Grove, we ionize a gas species by accelerating an electron into the gas species and knocking off another electron. In the first equation, we can see an electron plus a gas molecule equals an ion and two electrons and a photon. And then we can also have another reaction where we can take an electron, a gas molecule, create a metastable, an electron, and another photon. Now the photons are creating the visible part of the plasma that you can see, while the argon is going to do the bulk of the sputtering. So in our example here, we have our substrate up at the top. We have our argon molecule on the right-hand side. We have an electron down by the target, which is at a cathode potential, so it's negatively charged. And the electric fields are coming off normal to the target surface. So the electric fields are going to push this electron away from the surface and it's going to collide with our argon molecule. So our argon's gonna move out, the electron hits it, two, another electron comes off, and now we have an argon ion. Once we've created this argon ion, it is then going to see the electric fields produced by the cathode potential. So it's going to accelerate into the surface of the actual target material. Once that argon ion hits the surface of the target, it collects an electron, releases a secondary electron, and also releases a sputtered particle from the surface of the target material. Now, if we use Penning's discovery and add a magnetic field that creates a loop over the target surface that traps electrons above the target surface and allows them to collect in large numbers, which will increase the ionization efficiency. Now the electrons in our magnetic confinement are not standing still. First of all, they have a radius of gyration that is a function of the magnetic field strength at their location. And then next they are acted across our E cross B forces, which are created by the electric field that is coming out normal to the cathode surface and our magnetic field, which is looping over the target surface. So if we have on the right hand side, our magnetic field with a north polarity coming out and then going back into another magnet and with a south polarity on the other side, then we take the cross product of the electric field coming out of that target surface and the magnetic field going across, 
we find that the force acting upon those electrons is pushing them into the image shown here. That's why they are rotating, showing their radius of gyration, and then traveling further into the image that we've created here. Now, if we have our argon on the right-hand side, our argon neutral that would enter into our confinement zone, it would then turn into an argon ion, hit the target surface, and turn back into a neutral and travel out, while also once it hits the target surface, it'll sputter material which lands on our substrate. When we have a lot of gas species that start to travel into the magnetic confinement zone, a visible plasma starts to form from the photon emission of those ions and metastable species during the process of ionization or creation of metastables. Most of these species Traveling through the plasma will emit photons when pinged by electrons, and this allows the plasma emission spectroscopy to identify relative numbers of species in the plasma. So if you have a spectrometer and look at the light emission, not only will you see the ionization of the argon and the metastable creation, but if you have trace amounts of oxygen, nitrogen, water, hydrogen, or any other gas species in your system, they will also start to emit light. And the plasma is also primarily neutrally charged, so the number of electrons and ions in the plasma is going to remain fairly equal. Since our plasma is neutral, the ionization process and sputtering process both release electrons, so the electrons must leave the confinement to keep the plasma charge neutral. So if we take a cross-section of our cathode, which would have two magnetic confinement loops and the electrons would actually be traveling into the into the plane on the left hand side going around a turnaround and coming back out of the plane of view on the right hand side and then again going into a turnaround that is outside of our, our view then each time we have electrons being added into the pla into the system we have to have electrons coming out of the magnetic confinement and going into our anode surfaces. The number of electrons and ions in the plasma are proportional to the discharge current. So the discharge current is going to be the amount of current that is flowing to the cathode from a power supply. The secondary electron emission, gamma, of the target material is required to determine the estimated ion flux that is actually hitting the target surface. So our ion flux is equal to our current times 1 minus gamma. And gamma is often in the range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.3. And our current is actually going to be amperes times 6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons per amp. Now the sputter flux rate can be calculated when the target material sputter yield is known. So the sputter flux is going to be sputter yield times ion flux, and ion flux we calculated in the previous slide. Now the sputter yield is a function of the discharge voltage, and higher voltages lead to higher sputter yields, as you can see. So in this light gray box that we have is going to be basically the process space in which sputtering is going to run. And our voltage starting here is 200 volts to 1000 volts and that's basically going to be the range where most of the sputter processes are going to be working. Now for the green line here which is titanium you can actually see that if we start at 300 volts we're going to have a sputter yield of 0.3 and as we go all the way to a thousand volts that sputter yield is only going to go up to 0.7. So in the complete range of um, operation, normal magnetron operation, our titanium is going to always have a sputter yield of less than one, which means that more than one argon ion is going to have to hit a particular atom on the target surface to actually create a sputtered particle. This has been a short presentation on the 
basics of sputtering for rotary cathodes. If you have any questions, uh, please go out to our website and shoot us an email. And thank you very much for your attention.